SJC 13499, Commonwealth v. Victor Arrington. Okay, Attorney McLean. Thank you. Good morning. May it please the court. Ian McLean on behalf of the Commonwealth and along with me at council table is Edmund Zabin, who is actually the lead prosecutor in the case. I'm second seat at the trial level. Your Honors, the first question before the court is whether this issue falls within Rule 15A2 or it's a 2113. Respectfully, uh, it is a Rule 15A2. Uh, that question is measured by whether what we're dealing with is a motion to suppress or the functional equivalent of a motion to suppress. Where That's is the legal authority for that last test? I'm sorry, Your Honor? The functional equivalent test. Where is the legal authority for that? Well, I'd say this court has over a series of cases starting in 86 with um, Beausoleil, then to 2009 Arrington, then 2013 Spencer, and then in footnote one of Fontenez in 2019, all of those were motions in limine, not motions to suppress, and this court allowed them to proceed under Rule 15 as opposed to 211.3. So really the point is whether the thing is the functional equivalent of a motion to suppress or not. So what are the hallmarks of a motion to suppress? They're all seen here. Um, a motion, a memorandum in law, an evidentiary hearing, a written decision with factual findings and conclusions of law, all of those things happened here. That decision being a final decision as opposed to a traditional motion in limine, which could be revisited. How, how, counsel, how about if we go back to kind of the 15A's uh, textual roots? Uh, those other cases, are, there, there seems to be a situation where there really isn't much left for the Commonwealth if that motion in limine, or however you, you say it's functional equivalent of a motion to suppress, if it's allowed, there really isn't much left. That's really not the case here, right? I mean, there's, there's, a, there's a lot of evidence for Attorney Zabin to work with here uh, when it comes to Mr. Arrington. You've got a cooperating witness that can make an ID. You've got other kinds of G, uh, video surveillance of the car that's alleged that Mr. Arrington's alleged to have come to the scene in. Other phone record evidence. So this isn't the case where the Commonwealth would be really hamstrung in proceeding without this particular uh, location uh, evidence. Your Honor, I point you to two cases. I respectfully disagree with you about the impact of the evidence, and I'd point you to two cases in response. The first being um, Bosalil. Bosalil was uh, a paternity case, basically mm -hmm. a criminal paternity case, and the evidence in question was blood group typing. Well, that's very power. That would be a potentially a very powerful way to establish parentage. It's not the only way. I mean, the other parent can testify, so it's very important, maybe critical, but it's not determinative. Like the case wouldn't have to be dismissed without that blood group type sure. testing. It's corroborative of that parent. Just as here, the evidence that we're talking about that's going to place the defendant closer to the crime scene at the time is corroborative of our cooperating witness, who will clearly have some be open to a very serious credibility attack. Well, not, so, that, not that it's a numbers thing, but when you talk about that other case, when you look at how much is left in order to proceed, there's certainly, again, far more here than there was in that other case to make that potentially a, a differentiator. Potentially, Your Honor, but then I'd point you to the Lucian Arrington case in 2009. Um, where what we're talking about there was a domestic violence case and the victim's uh, sworn testimony at a, at a detention hearing, I believe it was, mm -hmm. and then they passed away before trial. So there are other ways to proceed in a domestic violence case than just the first-hand account. The first-hand account, incredibly powerful evidence, but you can proceed on the basis of a 911 call and the officers who responded and their observations at the so time. If we're going by text of the rule and then the expansion of that through our court over, over time, what's left? as far as the motion in limine goes, what wouldn't satisfy Rule 15? Well, a traditional motion in limine, Your Honor, so uh, prior okay. bad acts or, or is gang evidence admissible or something. These things that are subject to revision a, during a, the trial. A hearsay exception? Sure. A subject cited utterance? Oh, those are all that, subject, those are all traditional motions in limb ruling that will be subject to revision based on how the evidence comes in at trial. The real distinction is, are we talking about excluding a piece of evidence, a final ruling excluding a so piece of evidence? Any motion in limine that excludes a piece of evidence is subject to Rule 15 under your rule? It, it, the, under the your real, interpretation of the rule. The real crux is whether it's a final ruling or not. Um, so the, the essential hallmark of a motion to suppress is a final ruling excluding evidence from trial. That's not going to be revisited. So here, this will not be revisited depending on how the evidence comes so in trial. A, so if it's a hearsay objection, judge says, I need, you know, it's denied subject to further testimony. I get that. But anything that's a final rule and that excludes evidence, Rule 15. I, Your Honor, I wouldn't want to go so far as to create a blanket rule that said anything that was. But the, the, the crux of it is what makes it the functional equivalent of a motion to suppress is the, the, final, the finality of the ruling. Wouldn't you just bring everything as a motion to eliminate then? 
No, Your Honor, I, I don't understand why somebody would engage in that level of gamesmanship. It, does, it doesn't, the caption is not what controls, it's the functionality that controls. I mean, you see that in the, in the post-conviction context all the time, where things are moved back and forth between 30, 29, 25, based on the substance, not the caption. So functionality, what's, functionally what's happening, this was the functional equivalent. Even if this court was to determine that it wasn't within 15A2, and this is a 211.3, then we've still cleared that initial threshold burden of, of this court needing to invoke its extraordinary supervisory powers here, because this type of evidence would be excluded from this trial and potentially in other trials on the basis of the ruling we're looking at here. So this type of evidence might not ever get into trials when it should. So that's enough to clear the initial threshold under 211.3 to reach the merits. So based <clears> on <throat> that, why don't we talk about frequent location history methodology. <clears throat> and um, the, the, the issue here is the application of the methodology. And it may well be that the right witness, I don't know, an Apple engineer, for <clears throat> instance, might wit right witness might get you through to gatekeeper reliability, but, but here we have very little to be able to understand um, uh, how we apply testing error rates, peer review, publication standards, or even general acceptance into the scientific community through the witness that you chose. Well, Your Honor, I'd start with regarding the witness that we chose. Uh, of course, we would love to have an Apple engineer come in and testify, but it's proprietary material, and they, they're not willing to share that sort of information with us. They and and, and you've looked for non-Apple engineers to testify as to what happens in what clearly is a black box based on the evidence presented? Your Honor, the, the correct... Don't field. think that, that you could find an engineer to reverse engineer what the Apple engineers have done? I'm sure Apple's competitors would be loath to, to, to know that we could find somebody that was capable of reverse engineering their code. Um, that doesn't answer my question. You have looked? We had a, we had a, house, a person in-house that tested the device, and we felt that was sufficient to meet the standard. And I point you to, as an example, think about a shaken baby case. A medical doctor could testify and be a qualified expert to offer an opinion and get you through a diagnosis process just a regular MD. A pediatrician might be a better expert. But, but it, wouldn't that be up to the trial judge at that point? Sure. If, if I'm a trial judge and I have a pediatrician uh, discussing shaken baby syndrome, and I said, you know what, not good enough um, based upon the qualifications of this expert. You do this at your peril. Right. Sure, sure, Your Honor. Sure, Your Honor. Yes. And you called this witness at your peril with this technology. Yes, the pediatric neurologist might be the best choice in the shaken baby case. But here, the, the, the reason the judge got it wrong, and his first and most essential error here, was in misidentifying the relevant field of expertise. He misunderstood the evidence we were talking about, and he believed the relevant field of expertise was cellular technology. Don't you, don't you need <clears throat> uh, somebody to explain <clears throat> the algorithm that achieves the results? To explain the algorithm, no, Your Honor. All that we're needing to establish here is that what comes out of this black box, as we're describing it, is a reliable estimate of where the phone is. So the testing that this, that this digital forensics person did, Mr. Kinding did, who is a qualified expert in the appropriate field of digital forensics, by the way, none of the three amici disagree with digital forensics being the correct field, and I'd also point you to the Mosley's case out of I'm Rhode not Island. Not, <clears throat> not talking about qualifications. <clears throat> we're, we're talking about uh, uh, Delbert Lanigan or, 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 or general acceptance. Put aside qualifications. That, 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 that hill is much less steep. You've got to understand through the non-exclusive Daubert Lennigan factors how it is that you apply a known methodology to this technology. Your Honor, what we have in the testing that was done is a jailbroken phone so that we could see all of the data points that were created from where the phone was that and then we corroborate. And then we can see the frequent location that comes out as a result. And see You're saying that corroborates. Correct, Your Honor. But that, that corroborates doesn't explain. <clears throat> we don't have to explain how the code itself works. All that we have to show is that what comes out of it is a reliable estimate of where the phone was. That's all that we have to show. I guess I'm wondering why, why are 10 locations that are accurately identified enough? Why is it an abuse of discretion to say, 10 to 12 locations, not enough. Well, first off, it wasn't 10, so that's... So it, 12. In, and it's not just 12 frequent locations or 12 locations visited, it's the thousands of individual data points that he looked at in the process. So all of those data points... So, so, so you, your expert 
in that field, went to 12 locations, and out of an iPhone, which is a different model using a different operating system, accurately identified those locations. And you think it was an abuse of discretion for the trial judge to exclude that evidence? Yes, Your Honor. First, because he got the relevant field of expertise incorrect, so he discounted whether it's generally accepted in the field or not. There was no testimony that contradicted the expert witness's testimony that it is generally accepted, and that's the single most important of the Dalbert-Lanigan factors, as the Supreme Court said in Davis. So that factor was satisfied. So now, he had to, to believe the expert whom he didn't think was qualified to tell him what was in the black box, that it was generally accepted in the field of what he thought was the wrong field? Your Honor, it's, it's almost as though he said, the correct field here is zoology. And because you're not a zoologist, I'm not going to listen to you. The correct field is digital hey, forensics. The correct field is digital forensics and not cellular technology. Because what we're talking about here is a process that uses cellular, a result from cellular technology, a result from GPS, a result from Bluetooth, a result from Wi-Fi, does an amalgamation of those into a single location data point, and then says when there's a, a cluster of these data points in the same area, I'm going to create an estimate to represent, uh, I'm going to create an, uh, something to represent that cluster of data Right, points. and everything about that last part, right, other than the GPS and the Wi-Fi, everything about that, as Justice Lloyd was saying, that algorithm, that process, that methodology is a complete black box to this particular expert, right? Correct, to anyone outside of Apple. Right, so, well, where is your evidence of that? I, maybe I misspoke then. As far okay. as it's a proprietary technology. Your expert, to your mm -hmm. expert, the only testimony that we have in this case is that your expert has no idea why this works. He can't, he does not know the algorithm, and he testified on the stand that it was proprietary to Apple. He does not know the algorithm. What he had was a, a test device where he could see the data inputs and see the data outputs, and he knew where the phone was at all of those times. So he can establish that what's happening in the algorithm is creating a reliable estimate of where the phone actually was. That's all that we're talking about. Twelve here. times. <clears throat> Thousands of data points. 12 locations. Right. So for, for, for the 12 locations, it correctly identified those locations using a different model iPhone with a different operating system. And the only testimony was there was no significant changes to the operating system's location services function. The model of the phone is completely but irrelevant. Why do you say that? Because How could it be? This is a software product, not a hardware product. And where does the software reside? On the phone. Is yes, the on the hardware of the phone. The operating system is what controls the functionality. On the hardware of the phone where it's burned in. Isn't that right? That's correct. Okay, so the model, which has a different hardware, necessarily might affect the operation of the software. Well, I'd, I'd respectfully disagree with you about that, Your Honor. Where <sighs> is the evidence of that? The, the testimony was that there was no significant change in the operating systems between 8.1 and 8.4. But the testimony, I think, also was that your expert had no idea, in terms of the algorithm, what it was. So how could he say that there was no difference in the algorithm on each of the operating systems? Then, Your Honor, what I'm going to do is point you to a category of evidence that the motion judge completely omitted from his analysis entirely, corroboration on the actual evidence phone itself of frequent locations that were both before and after the murder. The one before at Newton District Courthouse, the day before the murder, and if you look at other components of evidence on the phone, it corroborates that the phone was in that Newton District Courthouse at the time the frequent location said it was. Mm -hmm. A text message at 8.15 saying I'm on my way to court, and then <clears throat> a photo taken of the daily case list in Newton District Court at about 8.50. Well, I, I, we, I, we've read through that, and I, I don't disagree with you on that. I still go back to Justice Gaziano's point because I don't know that I've gotten an answer to this. Assume for the sake of argument that it was 100% unchallenged, what, that, what your expert said. And why is it that when, when Judge Doolin says, this still doesn't convince me, and in his discretion says that this doesn't meet the Delbert Lanigan standard, assuming for the sake of argument that you said he's it's the wrong field, but that he comes to that conclusion and says, no, I don't think that this comes in. And, and why is that an abuse of discretion with all of the things that Justice Wendland pointed to or the infirmities with what already was in front of him? 
you have to apply the, the, the law correctly. An error of law is automatically an abuse of discretion. By misidentifying the relevant field of expertise, he failed to even evaluate the first and most important factor generally accepted in the relevant scientific field. That's your first error. Your second error is the failure to make any factual findings about the corroboration found in the evidence phone, in the test, in the evidence phone itself meaning those five frequent locations that were both before and after the murder. Made no factual findings about that at all. That's failure to make findings about a critical component. So you could remand that under jones Pinnell for the necessary factual findings, but it's all documentary evidence, so you could make those findings yourself. So, so uh, uh, I'm hearing you on testing. Um, where are you getting generally accepted? We, we, we've never addressed this issue. As I recall from the brief, there's, there's, there's no court that's addressed the application of this methodology. I, I expect, just like in Davis with speed, that, that the right expert would, would achieve gatekeeper reliability. But where are you getting generally accepted in the scientific community here? Well, it comes from the testimony of the witness, and it was the only witness that testified, so the only evidence that was before the motion judge was that it's generally accepted so in the field he, of so he, But he doesn't know this technology. That's, that's, I mean, so if you have this expert, a CSOI type person, right? And, and if we're not requiring um, someone from Verizon to show up in court, actually back in the good old days, they used to, but we're past that with CSOI because of where it's, where it's been. So now you can have these kind of workaday experts come in and say, I did the CSLI map and here's what we got. And that's what this uh, particular witness does a lot of. But here we're not dealing with something that's been around for a long time that's been tested. We're dealing with something new. And I think the point that we're trying to ask you about is how is it that he's a reliable reporter that it's generally accepted where there's no court cases, there's nothing that says it's generally accepted. Well, I would, so I would point you to, to Mosley's and to Pierce, but Mosley's was, granted it was Google on the Android operating system, but it's the same exact same function. Basically. And we have testimony to that effect? No, but we have the case that, that, was, that was provided to you. I mean, as a, as a matter of law, it has this No, but concept we have testimony before. that the iPhone using this technology is equivalent to Google Android? No, there's one of the one of the papers that was introduced as an exhibit. Um, one of the articles from 2009 was a comparison between Apple's iOS system and Android's Android's OS system, saying that they were. Doing Can the I same ask thing. you a slightly different question? What is what effect does the use of the intended use of this technology have on um, on on the Daubert Lanigan test? That is, as I understand it, and you correct me if I'm wrong because you know the record better than I do, um, this technology was developed by Apple in order to help target advertisements to users, um, and, 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 and that may, as far as we know, affect the, the algorithm that, al that Apple has developed. Do you, do you have any... Well, understanding as to how the use, intended use of the original, um, what is it, frequent location history, um, affects Daubert Lanigan? I, I think I understand your question, and I think so. So I would start with um, the Can Canavan's case, recognizing that depending on the methodology you're talking about, these five factors have to be applied flexibly, and there are other things that could be used. Because really the goal is just about determining whether this thing is reliable or not, sufficiently reliable to get in front of a jury. But the, I guess, yeah, my, so I, mm -hmm. sorry to interrupt you, but you're running out of time. I'm wondering, is it reliable to use a technology developed for an entirely different application to identify precisely where this defendant is? Yes. The, the original Fry test was about scientific reliability, and then the court shifted to Dalbert Lanigan in an effort to allow more actual valid science to get into courts because there hadn't yet been enough time for academics to do the sort of peer review testing sort of process. And that's why Dalbert Lanigan came into existence with its multiple factors to look at instead of Fry, which was just general acceptance. But, but do you, are you aware of a case where the technology is developed for a particular use and then applied differently and said to be reliable? for that different application? 
Well, but the, the core point here is where the phone is. It's only valuable to, to Apple if it's correctly placing the phone in the correct location so that the targeted location-based advertising is of value to them. All that we're looking for here is the same concept. And it's not a precise spot. The phone is right here. It's an estimate. So it's like CSLI in that we do a, a, a map that shows what it, a cell tower's coverage area is. And that is always subject to cross-examination because there's bleed beyond the, the traditional pie wedge. And it's influenced by a series of things. Here what we're talking about is an amalgamation of technology, GPS, Wi-Fi, and it creates an estimate of exactly where the phone is. It's subject to the same kind of cross-examination. This is not the junk science that's meant to be excluded from a jury's consideration. It just seems to me that if, <clears throat> you know, for CLSI, is that right? CSLI? CSLI. CSLI. It's important to identify where the phone is because for its functionality, um, you know, to... to, to to ping off the right tower, it's important that you know where the phone is. Whereas if I'm trying to say, you know, what's Ann Taylor's latest sale, it's not so important that I know exactly where the phone is in the same way. Do you understand my question? I do, Your Honor. Okay. If you ask your phone, where's a good coffee shop, if the recommendations that's going to come back to you are based on where you are. That's why the location services are of value, or the frequent location function, meaning your phone is aware that you're roughly driving to the court this, for work this morning, and your phone may have advised you there's a traffic jam on Cambridge Street, use an alternative route. Because it, that's why it's of value to the user, why it's of value to Apple, because it knows roughly where you're going to be, not exactly where the phone is, but an estimate of where the phone is. And that's all that we're looking for here is an estimate. More precise than okay. CSLI, less can precise I, than GPS. Just one more question. Yes. Thank you. <clears throat> I, are you suggesting that that there's not a better expert? Are you suggesting because of the proprietary issues that there's not somebody who could take the witness stand, uh, explain the application of this methodology, and be able to teach us the algorithm and how it all applies and that you did the best you could, and this is the best any court's going to do for an expert in this area? I, I can't speak to that. Hypothetically, there could be an academic or a researcher somewhere that would be capable of providing more information. But as far as I know, as far as we know, as far as the record is, the, the algorithm itself is proprietary to Apple, meaning it's not known by anyone outside of Apple itself. So just to sum up, you're saying that your expert was good enough, and the judge said, your expert was not good enough, and the standard is abuse of discretion, and so that's what we have to decide. And I understand that you're saying that, no, he made an error of law, but we can look at it and see whether or not the expert was good enough. Is that correct? Cor correct, Your Honor, but it, it is an error of law to misidentify the relevant field because then he didn't evaluate the correct we criteria. Can, and we can look at that. Correct, Your Honor. Okay. And you, you can make factual findings on the corroboration because it's all documentary evidence. Very good. Thank, Thank you very much. Thank you. <clears throat> Attorney Mencken. Good morning. May it please the court. Attorney Michelle Mencken on behalf of Victor Arrington. It's seated with me at council table is Attorney Peter Parker, who is lead trial counsel in this case. <clears throat> Excuse me. I'll, I'll pick up um, where this discussion, where uh, Justice Wendland um, left off this discussion with the uh, the intended use of the FLH app, um, and it, it is, it's meant to be a predictive tool. The incomplete patent information that's in the Commonwealth's appendix at 114 talks about it being a predictive tool. And I think that we all have experience with our phones not knowing where we are. Hey, where's the nearest Starbucks? Well, it's in Albuquerque. And those things can sometimes get flummoxed because of the location settings that we have on our phone, the last thing that we were Google searching. Um, so I think it's important when you look at the testing that was conducted in this case, um, and I want to clarify that it was actually five locations that were tested, not 12. There were 12 visits. So there were repeat visits to these same locations. And in terms of the thousands of data points, those data points were all associated with those particular visits. But we don't know, <clears throat> we, the, the expert was able to look at those test sites and say, well, this looks pretty accurate to me, but we don't know that the settings on the phone were the same. We don't, we know that Christopher Kindig had 
every single option turned on to enhance accuracy on this phone, and we have no idea what the settings were on Arrington's phone. But we, we, we don't, but, but to Attorney McLean's point, though, uh, one of the concerns, and I don't know how much of a concern it is, uh, is the fact that, that Judge Doolin had information from Mr. Arrington's phone that, that at least, maybe not directly, but certainly uh, circumstantially suggests that whatever his settings were, were pretty accurate because he had information about where the phone was versus where Mr. Arrington was supposed to be, and, and they were one and the same. So pretty accurate won't cut it here, and that's because the question framed in the motion in limine is whether this expert could opine on the distance. Yeah, what was the radius again? 43 meters um, from a set of coordinates mm -hmm. that were assigned via an unknown mysterious process to a particular location. They want to say, they want their expert to be able to say that the phone was within 43 meters of that set of coordinates from a specific time to a specific time. So that's the question. Did this expert have the kind of expertise that would enable him to testify to the reliability of those measures? Now, he may have expertise in, it appears he knows how to look at the, locate the thousands of location data points. I wouldn't know how to do that. That requires some expertise. But it didn't tell him um, what these measures mean. For example, again, back to the patent information, that information indicates that the entry time is the time that the phone's location was determined, not the time that it got within a particular radius of a particular set of coordinates. And with respect to those other previous visits on the phone, there was no testimony or evidence that the entry or exit times were accurate or that the radius in those cases was accurate, that the phone was within that radius from that time to that time. And it really matters here because if the Commonwealth is saying that Arrington's phone arrived at 1038 within 43 meters of the crime scene, or near to the crime scene, but, but they also have evidence the selfie photograph, which was taken within that time frame, from a location that they will try to prove was at the corner of Paxton Street and Blue Hill Ave, which was established at the hearing that was beyond the 43 meters. So we know that the phone was beyond the 43 meters within the time frame. So as to where the inaccuracy is, it's just a guess. And, the, and Kent, Mr. Kindig himself said repeatedly, this is a hypothesis. It's kind of sort of like this. It looks like it's kind of doing that. So what do we make of that? When it, what does the trier of fact make of that? Did the, was the arrival time inaccurate? Do we assume that he arrived at a time and then subsequently got within 43 meters? Or was he consistently for that entire period of time beyond that 43 meters? For example, did he stay in his car the whole time? This evidence doesn't, can't answer those questions. We don't have that basis. The other, uh, the other way that I think it's important that this FLH app was not designed as a forensic tool to pinpoint a phone's uh, location in the past is that there's this law about an expert. Um, it's important to look at whether their testimony grows naturally out of the type of work that they do or whether they were forming this opinion for the purpose of litigation. And that latter scenario is what happened here. This had not been tested. This witness had never looked at FLH before. He, you know, jailbroke the phone and created this model for the purpose of uh, trying to suss out what was happening with this app. In, in that respect, it's a lot like the paint drying expert in Rintala who had some expertise with paint, but his, the, the, his theorizing about whether the paint was poured intentionally or how long it had been drying and things, this was something that he tried to explore for the purposes of that case and just didn't have a sufficient background experience, anything, 
uh, to draw from. Could I, can I interrupt you for a minute? Because I, I'll go with the two points you make in reverse order. Your point that an expert's on the witness stand talking about something that he or she doesn't do outside of the litigation area is certainly a, a reasonable um, gatekeeper reliability factor, but many, th many um, methodologies get through gatekeeper reliability when the person on the witness stand is applying the methodology for litigation purposes. So in other words, that's not dispositive. It's important. And then to your first points, when you methodically went through some of the infirmities that can be demonstrated here, that sounds like the basis for an opinion and cross-examination. What we're trying to get at here is not which methodology the jury will believe or how much they'll credit the expert, but whether the methodology is enough as a preliminary question of fact upon which admissibility depends on a preponderance of the evidence to satisfy gatekeeper reliability. Can you address that issue? Because th 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 those other points are important, but it just doesn't go to the core issue. We have <laughs> Absolutely. To so first, I want to I want to uh, challenge my my brother's representation that um, the trial judge here misunderstood the rel the relevant area. It is quite clear that the judge was focused on the subject of the motion and whether his words were the right words is irrelevant. We know that the deficiencies that he found with this expert's ability to talk about the methodology are that he, um, he, couldn't, ex he couldn't testify about the algorithm at all. He couldn't explain the meaning of the confidence reading, which certainly sounds like it's important, and I will say, that when my brother is talking about we're just saying this is an estimate, they're not really. <laughs> I mean, the witness used the word approximate, but he did not talk about a margin of error or an error rate. So when you say approximation, like approximately to what? What's the trier of fact supposed to do with that? And this witness couldn't give us that. He also couldn't explain why this uncertainty reading would vary from visit to visit to visit. He just knew nothing about the reliability or accuracy of the of the of the FLH apps readouts on these measures, which are the thing that the Commonwealth wants to use this evidence for. Not only does it have all of the other evidence that Justice George has summarized, but it also has pictures, it has evidence, pictures that it will say put Arrington's phone or Arrington himself in the place where they want him to be at the time that they want him to be. What they like about this evidence is how precise it looks. And that's the question is whether this witness could speak to that and he couldn't. His testimony that this was generally accepted as reliable is ipsy dixit. There was no support for that whatsoever. He tried to say these articles supported it, but they didn't. The cases and the articles don't concern FLH, they concern the core location services, GPS, uh, Wi-Fi access points. So those, that's the underlying technology, but this court's cases are clear that just, you know, for example, in Davis, they weren't, you know, the court was like, GPS is fine with us. The question is this device that is using, that is starting from the GPS and then calculating speed. Yeah. And that's what we have here. We have these location data things, which by the way, were, are gone on the subject phone. We don't have the underlying data, so we can't actually look at the reliability of these measures. We're trying to reverse engineer like a natural phenomenon, what is going on here. This question is not your problem, but is there, uh, is there an expert that, that, that could attempt to be able to do this, or is, is it well, Apple's proprietary, so um, this we can never find out whether or not uh, this could satisfy gatekeeper reliability. I recognize it's not your problem, but what, what's your thought on that? Well, I, I, don't, I, I agree that I don't think you have to have an Apple engineer disclose the source code. Certainly, that would be helpful. But we have seen cases where extensive um, testing by the scientific method that is rigorous and peer-reviewed over time can reveal with sufficient reliability the way that the mechanism is operating. 
Um, and that we just don't have here. Also, uh, you know, it's, it's awkward that the amicus briefs that sort of speak to the subject of, of frequent location history, I mean, we're not here on de novo review, but I would say at the least, you, what you can glean from the two forensic amici that submitted briefs is that there is more knowledge known to those experts. Those experts sort of spoke confidently about what you can rely on and what you can't rely on. And I'd say that I, I think that both of those briefs uh, supported Arrington's position. Um, and I'll just touch briefly upon the procedural question, although we do sort of argue that um, it appears that the appeal is here and it is going to be decided by this court, so it doesn't really matter to Arrington at this juncture. But let's say that this court uh, overturned the exclusion of this FLH evidence, and we went back down and said, Judge, um, it's still more prejudicial than probative um, and or it's cumulative. Uh, let's say that the judge found another reason to exclude this evidence. Do we then come back here um, because that's a decision uh, excluding the evidence that is as final as the decision before the court? You know, it isn't inconceivable that the way that the evidence develops at trial, the Commonwealth wishes to reapproach this FLH evidence in a more narrow, sort of altered, you know, I keep emphasizing it's the way that, it's the opinion that they're trying to admit that has been excluded. But this expert does have some knowledge in some areas that perhaps could be, become relevant later. This is not necessarily the kind of final decision like a motion to suppress that is collateral. It is done well in advance of trial so that the automatic stay that happens with Rule 15 doesn't mess up the entire trial schedule. Um, uh, these are distinctions between this kind of evidentiary ruling, which is subject to change, which happens in the course of a sort of a busy trial. That, 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 might, be, that might be true, but when you, when you do do a not so slow walk through our jurisprudence, it does seem as if there have been instances where we've kind of stretched the, the parameters of 15 to subsume some things that, you know, arguably could be, should have been 211, three issues. Uh, do, do you, what do you think about all of the other stuff when you say, even though we have this other evidence, that this still, if it operated the way that Attorney McLean is saying, that it's over and done with with this issue? And, and so therefore it is ripe for uh, 15 review. Well, as I just sort of argued, it, it's over and done with, with, this, with this opinion. Sure. But, it, but the, the FLH perhaps could be reapproached later. With respect to the other cases where these Rule 15. Um, uh, but, but let me just focus on that before you move on. How? How could this FLH data be revisited in another way that might be relevant and admissible with the same witness? Uh, well, I, I honestly, I'm not prepared to answer that question. I'm not going to, I can't. But doesn't that go to, to his point? That it couldn't come in any other way and that even though there might be other evidence that might be supportive of the government's position and burden, that this is the type of decision that we've, 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 we've shoehorned into 15 over the years. Well, I, I disagree that it is the type of decision that has been shoehorned in because I think that as um, the amicus uh, CPCS brief points out, and I um, hereby move to expressly adopt all of their arguments in our position. Um, but uh, they point out that in each of those cases, uh, the issue was dispositive, or it just wasn't challenged and it wasn't really looked at, and it's being looked at now in this case for the first time. But there are myriad evidentiary rulings that similarly could be characterized as final. They're not going to be revisited. And it's impossible to sort of sit back and imagine how the evidence might, I mean, unexpected things happen at trial all the time, which is why I'm not prepared to sort of brainstorm all the potential things that could happen here. But, you know, it's, the, it's really the, the minority motion that isn't, that 
isn't con looking final from the moment that you get that ruling. Well, we're stuck without that evidence or we're stuck with that evidence. We could sort of always come, and there's a tremendous imbalance, as I think I pointed out in my brief. The Commonwealth would have a much greater opportunity to stall the process of the trial because defendants don't get Rule 15 appeals very rarely. Um, so I hope that you would take that into consideration as well. Um, and as we've pointed out, we do have, you know, we do have these other Dobert issues sort of lined up. Um, and the, if the process were altered in the way that the Commonwealth is asking this court to do, this uh, esteemed uh, bench would find itself entangled in pretrial evidentiary process in superior court in a way that typically it has been loath to do. If there are no further questions, I'll rest on my brief.